We're happy, happy to welcome uh, Leopoldo Sanchez. Uh, he uh, is a professor of systematic theology um, and professor of Hispanic ministries also at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, he's the author of several books, including this new one, which if you haven't read it, uh, you should get it because it's really wonderful, Sculpture Spirit. Um, bottles of Sanctification from Spirit Christology. I think he'll be bringing some of that into his talk today. And he's also doing a plenary tomorrow, and then that's repeated on a Saturday, uh, where he'll be talking about some of the themes uh, in this book. Also happy to have with us, uh, again for a little bit later in this uh, this seminar, uh, David Bielham. David just retired at the end of last month after a, a, a long pastorate um, at Madison Square Christian Reformed Church here in Grand Rapids. And now, uh, well, he's actually started this before he retired, but he's also teaching here at Calvin Seminary. He's leading some, uh, some peer learning groups for us and working with our vocational formation office. Uh, and so we're very happy to have David here too, and he will eventually also be sharing uh, some of his story and some of his practices. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Leopoldo and I ask you to welcome him. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you for your kind hospitality. Uh, David, you look so young. What's this thing about retirement? Anyway. Retirement is not Amen, amen, yeah. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to be in your midst. I was um, asked to begin with a sermon um, that brings out some uh, Global South themes, uh, particularly thinking in terms of God's hospitality towards strangers. Uh, so it, it is appropriate that uh, I thank you once again for allowing this stranger to uh, be in your midst. <laughs> um, so just to give you a little background about this uh, homily. Uh, the setting for this homily was actually where I teach at the Chapel of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Now one thing to keep in mind is that this is, number one, a Lutheran. Uh, institution, and, and because of that, number two, uh, historically, uh, 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 culturally German, if we may put it this way. Even to this date, uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is less than 1% Hispanic, just to give you an idea, right? So it's, 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 we're talking about a majority um, white, English-speaking denomination with German roots. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of the, the um, congregation. <laughs> uh, also, at that time, we had sort of what I would call a second audience, and this brings challenges when you have to preach, when you have two different groups uh, in, the, in the same place. So the other uh, group here were our Spanish-speaking students, some of them bilingual, uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, uh, who uh, visit campus every so often for intensives. So they too were there. So they were participating in the worship service and in the readings. And of course, you had this Hispanic, Latino uh, member of the faculty preaching that day. So that gives you an idea of what I'm dealing with, okay? And this takes place in ep Epiphany season. So kind of, you know, in the same season we're now. And I entitled this uh, homily, Galilean Epiphany. And I uh, began that day, and I begin here this day, en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text is from John 1, 45 through 46. Nathanael said to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. In my travels around the country, I am often reminded of my origins. After a little conversation here and there, Someone often asks me, so where are you from? Typically, the accent is what gives me away. I've gotten that question 
so many times, I now have an internal mechanism that quickly triggers a nicely packaged response. I was born in Chile, raised in Panama, and have now lived in the U.S. longer than I ever lived in Chile or Panama. As if to say, you know, I'm kind of becoming one of you little by little, but I'm still not apparently there yet. Now that response puzzles people even more, leading to other questions. The more common one being, so how do you become a Lutheran? (laughs) When we are used to seeing things a certain way, it's a little challenging to get our minds wrapped around unexpected surprises. Where traditional expectations are not met, people struggle a little or a lot to deal with or make sense of the new reality. Some, like Philip, receive the news with wonder and can't wait to tell others. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Others, like Nathaniel, receive the news with doubt or hesitation. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Hmm. Since according to more traditional messianic expectations, no great prophet was supposed to come out of Nazareth in Galilee, no one expected God to speak his word and give eternal life to his people through a Galilean savior. You see, Galileans are not your ideal Jews. They have accents. <laughs> Do you remember how people in Jerusalem discovered that Peter was one of Jesus' disciples? Bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them. For your accent betrays you. You are a Galilean. It was the darn accent that gave him away <laughs> as a follower Of Jesus the Galilean. Due in part to its geographical location, Galileans had a higher likelihood to come into contact with Gentiles than Jerusalem Jews did, which cast some suspicion on the purity of their Jewish religious identity and their faith in God. No self respecting Jerusalem Jew looked to Galilee for good theology or good practice, and much less for God's salvation to be revealed. Galilee is not Jerusalem. If you want to be a pure and holy Jew, if you want to find one, the word on the street is that you go to Jerusalem, the holy city, right? The privileged center of Jewish social, political, and religious life. This is the place of the religious leaders of Israel, the center of learning, of wisdom, of power, goodness. Jerusalem is where the temple is. Can't get any better than that, right? It is God's own dwelling place. If there is any place at all where God's salvation should be revealed, it has got to be holy Jerusalem, where the holy people hang out. Or is it? Galilee is not supposed to be a the place where God reveals his power and wisdom. But God's ways are not our ways. God has a habit of surprising us with the unexpected, of turning our world upside down. And that's the saving mystery of the cross, isn't it? God reveals his power through what we see as weak, and his wisdom through what we see as foolish. Against all human expectations, God surprises us and gives us Jesus, a Galilean Jew from Nazareth, to be our Savior. 
This Jesus is God's new temple. And where he is, God himself is, and we have holy ground. Where Jesus is, we have salvation and lives transformed. So, what does this all mean for Jesus' disciples, for us today? There is something ironic in Nathaniel's words. He does not believe God can work out of Galilee. And yet he himself is a Galilean from Cana, just like Peter and Andrew are Galileans from Bethsaida. Can God work through someone like me, a Galilean? Can any good church come out of here? Not only is Jesus Galilean, his disciples are Galileans. Jesus and his disciples have strange accents. Could you imagine Jesus had an accent? (gasps) Really? And so, like Jesus, these disciples too are rejected by the wise and the powerful, the world and the flesh, which does not look for God's prophets and wise teachers in marginal places like Galilee. We too are like Nathaniel. At times, we are doubtful about the power of Jesus to save and transform lives among strange people and in places where we least expect it. Can anything good come out of fill in the blank? When we do so, we see with the eyes of the flesh. We do not see Jesus at work in the most unlikely places. We are a bit suspicious, or to put it in polite terms, cautiously optimistic. (laughs) We are no longer open to being surprised by God's power among unlikely folks and places. But when we trust in God as people called by Jesus and see life not with the eyes of the flesh, but now with the eyes, the lens of the Holy Spirit, the eyes of faith, we now are more like Philip in the text for today. We see Jesus in Galilee, out of Galilee, sending from Galilee. We are pleasantly surprised and can see God's salvation at work in places where at first it seemed odd or impossible to find His power and wisdom. Who are the Galileans of our time? Well, we have some Galilean brothers and sisters here in our midst, in chapel this morning, being formed for ministry together with you. You just heard one of them read the Word of God, and you will soon sing with them in a different language. Yes, God is working, even among peoples with strange accents and customs from strange places. People who do not always neatly fit into our cultural norms or congregational life, whom God has nevertheless called to serve His church to bring the gospel of life to a hurting world. Jesus is at work today in modern Galilee. And is blessing our church through modern Galileans from strange lands. Bringing God's word and new life against all odds, even in places where some of our congregations are even wondering if they should close their doors. Sometimes... We forget that our Lord Himself came from Galilee and that the church is at its very core a bunch of Galilean people. Modern Galileans with accents remind Lutherans in the United States of their own origins. For the Lutheran church too was once a church of Galileans with accents 
and strange customs and traditions, some might say that's still true today. (laughs) And yet, God worked His salvation through these Germans and through their descendants has brought the gospel of life to many of us sitting here today. But more than that, the modern Galileans with accents also remind us of our own Christian identity. For what is the church but a little group of strange Galilean disciples that do not speak or act like the world does? What is the church but a little Galilean flock that is ridiculed and persecuted by the world because it sings to a different tune and walks to a different drumbeat to the world. You sound like a people with strange accents and customs. And yet, God has revealed His salvation, His power and wisdom for the sake of the world through people who in the eyes of the world are nothing, insignificant, weak, foolish through you. Through modern Galileans, like our Hispanic Lutheran brothers and sisters, and yes, through Philip, God is inviting us again to be the Galilean church He has called us to be. The community where God still does surprising and mighty things in unlikely places. And through unlikely people like you. Hey, Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Out of Galilee? Well, yes, Nathaniel, yes. Open your eyes. It is happening right now. Right here. Even in this old Lutheran seminary. Even in this old Lutheran church. Come and see. It's a Galilean epiphany. En el nombre del Padre, y del Hijo, y del Espíritu Santo. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. (laughs) So, that is the Galilean epiphany homily. (laughs) At Concordia Seminary, San Luis. So, we'll take a a little time maybe to go through what uh, my strategy was when I was preaching on this text. And and then I'd love to hear maybe some feedback from you, and we'll have time for questions and so on. So, let me see, make sure we're here in the right place. All right, so the context, unpacking the sermon. Um, We have a Spanish language program at the seminary that certifies people for ministry, both pastoral and diaconal. And they come from many places in the United States and represent many Latin American countries. So even though when we think of Hispanic in the U.S., we think homogeneous one group, this is one of the most diverse groups I have ever uh, instructed. So they were on campus, and uh, but as I said before, there were two audiences, right? Because they were there visiting, uh, but at the same time we have a mostly Anglo culturally German seminary community, English speaking. So our challenge was, how do you preach this text without excluding anyone per se, right? So that we don't end up in this kind of we day game, right? But so that we enter scriptures, the scriptures together, right? And and so that together we're invited to a new uh, way of life. So that was a a challenge for me, the two audience uh, challenge. How do we, on the one hand, acknowledge sins, so exclusion, prejudice, and things like that, right? But at the same time, not dwell on that so much that we fail to see God's gifts in our midst, Uh, particularly from folks who come from places not traditionally represented, in U.S. Lutheran circles, okay? So how do you sort of convict, but at the same time help people rejoice in what God is doing? So that was a bit of the challenge. And the text, as I mentioned before in the liturgical setting, was from Epiphany season. 
a light to the nations, comes out of Galilee of the Gentiles. This kind of idea. And this is actually a perfect text um, uh, because uh, in Hispanic Latino circles in the United States, there's a lot of discussion about the Galilean identity of the church. So this is kind of a theme that you find uh, in Hispanic Latino theology and missions in the United States. And in no small uh, way, because of the influence of Virgilio Elizondo, Father Virgilio uh, Elizondo, I'll show a picture of him later, uh, who was a um, Roman Catholic theologian uh, working as a priest in uh, San Antonio, Texas. So, you know, he was in what we would call the borderlands, right? The borderlands. And so he raises a question, you know, what is the fact that Jesus comes out of Galilee theologically significant, right? Is it theologically significant? Or is this just kind of an add-on to the text, right? Is this just sort of accidental, right? That his disciples are from Galilee. Uh, that in the book of Matthew, for instance, Matthew 28, and we always we like the whole mission emphasis here about making disciples of all nations, but we often forget that they're, the risen Lord sends uh, the Galilean disciples out of Galilee to go out into the world. So Gal- Galilee as a mission, you know, launching uh, place out to the world. So is this theologically significant, and what do we do with that? So uh, it just kind of... Uh, it was a gift, right? When you get a text that sort of uh, works out well for you. <laughs> so, um, the other thing about this text, uh, I wanted to highlight that the text is really an invitation to participate in a certain form of life, right? Uh, what form of life is the text bringing us into, challenging us to be shaped after? So, in that sense, um, every preaching event is a Holy Spirit event, right? Where the Spirit is bringing hearers of the words to become participants and thereby shaped into the likeness of Christ. And in this case, we're talking about Christ the Galilean, the one at the margins, and yet the one who comes out of the margins, right? Uh, to bring the light of God to the world. So, an invitation to participate. And Nathaniel's question really kind of, you know, gets the juices flowing. Uh, on the one hand, you can ask, what does the text say about God? Well, God works out of Galilee, right? So they're to be surprised. He works out of unlikely places where people do not typically look for God's wisdom and strength. So that's one thing. What does the text say about God and the things that God does? Uh, the other question is, what does it say about us? What does it say about the church? Since the disciples of Jesus come out of Galilee. Apparently the only one who maybe didn't was Judas. And he was kind of a troublemaker. Uh, But that's something that has to be dug into a little bit more. Uh, But the church itself is Galilean, right? And I kind of bring that out. You know, we're talking about the Galilean identity of the church. And you too are... Uh, Galileans in a sense. So what does it say about the church? Because sometimes we we might associate the church only with kind of its centers of cultural uh, power and uh, maybe religious knowledge. And and again, I'm not against institutions, right, Uh, as a means to further in the mission of the church. But sometimes institutions could become an end in themselves. And then we associate what is good about the church, where the power is and the wisdom is, and so to speak, right? And then we forget kind of what's going on at the margins, right? Uh, So we always have to be mindful of this. Uh, Sometimes I wonder, you know, uh, where are the satellites out in the margins where the church is sort of, right? Um, uh, in in the front, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the forefront of the surprising things God is doing out there, right? So, what does this mean for us today? And I wanted to, uh, as uh, through Nathaniel's question, get at those um, questions, so that we might be invited to think about God's character and also the church's identity.
Okay. Now this is, of course, a sensitive issue. Anytime you have to talk about marginality or otherness, uh, prejudice, discrimination, uh, which can happen within the church, uh, as we uh, well know. You're dealing with sensitive issues. So how did I deal with this factor in putting together the homily? Well, one of the things that I wanted to uh, bring out is that exclusion is a human problem, right? Um, so it's not just a German problem, see? It's not just an Anglo problem. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can talk about intra-Hispanic aggression of all sorts, too. Okay, so I, I wanted to, in some ways, without minimizing that sometimes majority groups can uh, be oppressive without minimizing that, right? I also wanted to say, look, this is a human problem. We often see reality through the eyes of the flesh, so to speak, and we fail to see reality through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so exclusion is a human problem, but eventually I wanted to move the focus away from us so that we didn't become the center of the narrative, but move it to God. God is now the subject. God is the agent. God is the one who surprises us with wonderful things from the margins. So look outside of yourself for a moment, okay, and see what God is doing. So step back, and I wanted to make that move, right? So acknowledging human sin, I wanted then to move to God's uh, overwhelming, surprising grace. All right, which is, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I'm sure this is a, a good move in the Reformation tradition, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm giving up something about my own identity here. Uh, anyway, so my focus was on putting God in the center as opposed to us, because then what ends up happening is that you get into this whole stuff about white guilt and Hispanic victimization. And, and, and then, you know, these are things that have to be dealt with and talked about, right? But if we are just in that kind of uh, human uh, way of talking about things, which is important, we might lose sight of how God can come into the situation to fix it or at least to begin to heal it, you see. So I didn't want just to uh, take this opportunity to say, uh, look, this is what you're not doing right, this is what you're doing wrong, right? Because then it becomes a blame game. Um, or you are not doing enough, and this kind of thing. What about going over to Philip, right? And, and inviting people to come and see. Come and dare to be surprised, Let's see what God is doing, right? So, Philip, I think his invitation uh, for me eventually is, uh, even in the text, where we want to eventually go, right? So, we want to move in that direction. Let's see what God is doing, which is really what Philip's uh, invitation is uh, in the end. All right, so then let's see what he's doing, okay? And the nice thing about chapel that day was that we actually had Right, Hispanic brothers and sisters who come from the margins of the church, uh, uh, and they are running the show. Right, I mean, they're the ones reading. Right, some with thicker accents than others. It's a beautiful thing. They're the ones reading scripture. Right, we have the preacher doing his thing. We have a mariachi. Yeah, there is a Mariachi Lutheran band, actually. <laughs> Believe it or not, you know, out of El Paso, Texas. And they were visiting that day. Uh, they, had, they even had like a Luther cross. You ever seen that Luther, or the Luther rose with the cross in the middle? In the back of their Mariachi, you know, stuff, you know. <laughs> they, they were the real, uh, the real deal, as they say. <laughs> so anyways, uh, come and see what's happening. This is what's happening, right? We have uh, Latinos and Latinas reading, preaching, and leading worship. So I don't have to talk in theoretical terms, right? I can help you to see what God is doing already in your midst, right? 
And so that was a wonderful way of showing that God is working out of the margins, right, in order to bring light right, to the world. Right? And, and working out of Galilee, in a sense, right? And then working through Galileans for the sake of the church's uh, mission. So that was really good. To open the eyes, right? This is what God is already doing in modern-day Galilee. All right, so homiletically, how do you, what strategy do you go about when dealing with a sensitive topic in a non-threatening way? Well, I've been teaching there for 16 years, so I think, you know, I have become a trusted person. People don't feel threatened by Dr. Sanchez, even when they know that Dr. Sanchez, you know, sometimes throws a little lightning bolt or something like that. But... But, you know, I've been in the community for a while, so I have built uh, relationships and so on. So it was a safe context for me uh, to talk about a sensitive issue, okay? And I began with personal experience, right? It was a safe place to do so, right? So I was a little bit vulnerable here, right? And I began with, look, the accent gives me away. People ask me, how do you become a Lutheran? Where are you from? I mean, so I opened up with my own experience, personal experience. And then in a sense I'm saying, but see what God is doing through this neighbor of yours, Leo Sanchez, right? Ends up teaching at the faculty of a Lutheran seminary, you know. So my first language is uh, Spanish, right? And I've, uh, you know, kind of been working on my English since I came to the U.S. So when you say that the book was well written, there's a lot of work that went into that. (laughs) I get the book in English. Um, and it's so funny, you know, you talk about God working miracles. I mean, the only class I ever flunked in Panama where I was raised was English. I had to go to summer school for English. So go figure, you know. God has a sense of humor, right? But the point I'm trying to make through the personal experience is not, it's not about Leo Sanchez, right? At the end of the day, it's the bigger point that God surprises us using Galileans with accents teaching in English, in this case, at the seminary, right? So I wanted to uh, use my own experience as a starting point. But not only to convict hearers for not seeing with the eyes of the Spirit and being kind of, let's put it this way, ethnocentric or Jerusalem-centric. And I am playing off Galilee and Jerusalem here. This is something that Virgilio Elizondo does in his work. That doesn't mean that there aren't images of Jerusalem as, you know, the the place of the new creation and all of that stuff. Uh, But Jerusalem can work in other ways too, right? So we're not saying this is the only image of Jerusalem, but it's one of them. Kind of played against uh, Galilee a little bit. Margins center. Uh, But the next move, as you saw, uh, or as you heard, excuse me, in uh, uh, in the homily, is to remind Everyone of their identity in Christ, which is you are a Galilean people in the world. So that was a little bit of what was going on here. And, uh, there is actually a term for this. When you use a personal experience and then expand on its universal significance. right? And I got this from um, Stephen Bevins, who is... Uh, uh, Roman Catholic uh, professor uh, in Chicago. I think he might be retired now, but he wrote this book, Models of Contextual Theology. So this is like a huge classic. Uh, it's, you know, had, I don't know how many reprintings, right? So uh, any time that you study theology and culture kinds of things, right? Uh, usually people go to Christ and Culture by Niebuhr, right? Something like that, which is another classic. But you got to read this one. Right, so this comes like after that. Uh, He was a missionary in the Philippines. So he brings also that sort of interaction with the other, the strange other. And there he talks about different ways of understanding the relationship between theology and context. Theology and context. Um, And one of the models he calls the transcendental approach. Uh, and he uses the analogy of a garden. He says, you know, uh, by bringing people into my own garden, then I help them understand their own garden. 
this kind of stuff. By uh, bringing in a, a, the particularity of someone's experience, I can help them see uh, something that is true uh, universally of all humans, uh, this kind of thing. So I took a local particular human experience, and that is the, the experience of Hispanic marginality, right? In order to teach the church at large, so not only German Lutherans, but kind of the church at large, what it means to be church. And so that's where I, in the homily, talked about you know, how you think that you're not strangers, but you're all weird people to the world because you speak a strange language and you sing these weird hymns and, you know, don't ever forget that. <laughs> don't get so comfortable thinking that you're kind of cool and hip. You're actually a strange people. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, playing with the center and the margins idea when talking about the particular and the universal, moving from the particular to the universal. And I, I think I learned that from Bevins, the transcendental approach method. So um, you notice that in the sermon, I had kind of three levels of marginality. And I kind of built on each. So the first one was Hispanics are at the margins. They're the Galileans, right? And who's at the center? The Germans or the historically German, culturally speaking, right? English speaking uh, church. Uh, but then I kind of turned that around and uh, I moved to the next level, which is Germans were once at the margin. So remember your own history. You came up those ships from Germany, right, up the Mississippi, and then you landed in Missouri and uh, read the newspapers from that day and what they were saying about them Germans coming in, right? You know, they don't speak English. Do they want to learn English? They bring diseases. I mean, everything we say about strangers and immigrants and foreigners, too. I mean, the same, exactly the same thing. You know. My wife is of Irish uh, background on her mother's side. Well, same thing. You know, the, the Irish, the way that Irish were portrayed, Irish immigrants in this country. I mean, and so you can go on and on, right? So don't ever forget that. What happens is time goes by, and then we get this kind of historical amnesia, and we don't remember that stuff. So I wanted to remind them of that, of their lowly origins, so to speak, you know. You too were Galileans at one point, a people with strange accents and customs. Don't ever forget that. Uh, and then, finally, I moved to the third level of marginality, where the church is at the margins and the world is at the center. Okay. So knowing or appreciating once again who you are, Right should now lead to solidarity with those who are at the margins today. Understanding your own marginality, right? right, And what God has done in your life, right? Now, the idea is to invite them to embrace God's welcoming heart towards strangers in our midst. So that was kind of the idea. So slowly, you know, using those three levels, yeah, right, going from the particular to the universal. So in a sense, uh, Hispanic identity um, um, teaches us something about the church herself. Hispanic is not sort of an oddity, uh, but... It actually tells us something about who we are at the core. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So, uh, anyways, so I mentioned Virgilio Elizondo earlier, right? Uh, Father Virgilio Elizondo, he has this thing called the Galilean Principle. He's got a couple of books. One is Galilean Journey, the Mexican American Promise. That was his uh, dissertation written in. Uh, uh, so born uh, in France, and then um, a God of incredible surprises, Jesus of Galilee, which is kind of a kind of a Christology of sorts. Um, easier reading, right? Uh, if if you are uh, interested in in that uh, more accessible work by him. So a God of incredible surprises. So the whole idea of there to be surprised, right? That comes out of. Virgilio Elizondo. Uh, 
Uh, so the tricky thing about beginning with a personal experience is that you don't want the personal experience to overtake the sermon. Because then the sermon becomes about Leo Sanchez. Well, what good is that, you know? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of interesting things I could say about myself, but that's beyond the point, right? The, the idea is how does that bring people into a kind of greater understanding of a reality that the text invites us to reflect on. So the Galilean location of the church. So you, you want a relatable experience, but you eventually want to be biblically grounded, right? Uh, which means being grounded in a biblical story or narrative. So the exchange between Philip and Nathaniel. Uh, now, Virgilio Lisondo has what he calls the Galilean principle. Okay, and the Galilean principle in the language of 1 Corinthians would be this idea that God reveals his strength through weakness, and you've heard that enough times in the homily, and that God reveals his wisdom through foolishness, right? So this is what we have in Christ himself, the power and the wisdom of God, right? Christ the Galilean, right? Christ the crucified. Uh, and this is why I ended up the sermon saying, hey, this is a Galilean epiphany, right? It's a revelation, right? Uh, God's revelation in Christ himself, and then Christ's revelation, right, uh, of how he does things in and through the Galilean church in the world. So uh, Virgilio Lisondo has been um, a good companion in the journey to think about marginality and hospitality, right? So when the biblical texts uh, invite us to think in terms of that dynamic of marginality and hospitality, Virgilio Lisondo gave me a new perspective on this, especially because he's a Mexican-American, okay? And what he says about Mexican-Americans, just to give you an example of marginality, is that because there are mix, uh, culturally, racially, linguistically, they're never good enough for either side of the cultural border, right? So Virgilio Lizondo says Mexican-Americans would be an example of a Galilean people who are kind of marginalized because they're not Mexican enough for the Mexicans and they're not American enough for the North Americans. They're truly kind of neither here nor there, right? Uh, and yet, he says, and yet because they are doubly uh, marginalized, or in spite of being doubly marginalized, uh, they also uh, invite us to see life in a new way. They are bridge people who can see the good, the bad, and the ugly on either side of the cultural linguistic border. They are a people who can therefore bring us together too. Yeah. So I think of my own, I mean my own family, right? So I am Sanchez, uh, born in Chile, raised in Panama. And my wife is German-Irish. Von Baron, right? So we're the Sanchez Von Baron family, right? Uh, it sounds like we're going on a world tour or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't have a, a show in Branson, Missouri yet. Okay, you've heard of Branson, maybe. Uh, but you know, were there questions about our union? Yes both from her side of the family. Who is this guy? Where does he come from, you know? And from my side of the family, right? Um, and especially, I mean, one, because I think, you know, the history of St. Louis has been very much kind of a black-white, painful history. And so my wife's family was raised on the kind of south side of St. Louis, white, uh, and, uh, you know, they weren't exactly raised to play with kids of a different color. Uh, and so they weren't sure what to do with sort of light brown over here, you know. It's like, what do we where does this guy fit? It's not clear, you know. Uh, and then uh, on my side of the family, we were raised in Panama, and Panama has kind of a love-hate relationship with the United States because of the U.S. presence in the Canal Zone. Right uh, now, all of that passed over to Panama in 1999. All the areas, right, uh, of the former Canal Zone reverted uh, to, to Panama. It was a process that started in the late 70s, uh, 
went through 1999. It's completely run by the Panamanians. But what I'm trying to say here is that I came from a very nationalistic family. So when they heard that I was marrying someone from the United States, they said, why are you, uh, you going to marry a, a Yankee? You know? Yankee is not a good word when, when said by a Panamanian uh, from the city of Panama. So we were a hybrid, right, strange, Galilean-like <laughs> experiment. And can God do anything out of this, you know? And so you had a lot of, you know, a lot of questions about whether we should have been welcomed fully into either family. And then all of that stopped with the grandkids. <laughs> Right? Because they're the true hybrids here, as it were, right? They're the Mexican-Americans, so to speak, to use Virgilio Elizondo's uh, uh, particular experience to teach us something greater, right, uh, about ourselves. Um, and yes, they have, been, they have become the British people, right? Uh, because now you bring two different languages, cultures, peoples into one adorable little baby, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a huggable, kissable baby, and now your world has to change. And sometimes it takes that to come and see, right? It doesn't have to be that drastic, but often it happens that way. And you notice how, in a subtle way, I, I kind of brought Isaiah 55 into this, God's ways are not our ways, right? I didn't go into it too much, but it was just kind of a way of illustrating further Bring into mind, you know, for those people who like to read the Old Testament, which, yes, it is part of the Bible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bring to mind that God is a God, you know, who does things not exactly the way we often expect Him to do. So, um, Scott mentioned uh, the book Sculptor Spirit uh, that I was privileged to uh, write. And in this book, I talk about five different ways in which the Holy Spirit forms or shapes Christ in us. Uh, and in, a, in the plenaries, I'm going to be speaking about three of those ways in which the Spirit shapes Christ in us, uh, including a model that I call the hospitality model. Um, and so, you know... The spirit as one who sometimes I like to call the pushy spirit. In other words, the, the, the spirit pushing the church into uncomfortable, marginal places. Uh, so an example of this, of course, is Jesus himself, right? Uh, uh, Jesus is anointed with the spirit for his mission. And that is a mission out of Galilee. So we have to locate also the spirit with Jesus, in Galilee, and out of Galilee, right? And then I love passages where Jesus enters into the world of the other. One of my favorite ones, and I could have preached on that one too, but we couldn't really do two sermons here, uh, would have been Luke 17, where it says that Jesus walked along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Yeah. What? Well, what does life in the Spirit look like for Jesus, right? The one anointed with the Spirit for mission. Out of Galilee, but then also into borders, right? Those borderlands where everybody is suspicious and, right? Nobody likes to walk along th those borders. Um, and again, Galileans and Samaritans, right? Are they in or out? They seem to be out. They don't really belong in the kingdom. They're not as pure as they should be. Not good theology. Not enough good practice comes out of there. Um, and yet Jesus goes and walks through there, right? And then uh, lepers also make their home along the borderlands, right? So you're talking about excluded, excluded people. Uh, and yet who's the one who comes back and gives thanks to God and praises Him? Huh? Come and see, right? There to be surprised, right? Uh, the one who's doubly marginalized, the Samaritan leper. Excluded for being Samaritan and excluded from being a leper. And that's the one who comes and gives thanks, you know? Can anything good come out of the borderlands between Galilee and Samaria? Yes, come and see. See? So there are texts like that, you know? Uh, and it shows us what life uh, in the Spirit is. Uh, the, the other one I love would be uh, from the book of Acts. Uh, the, the ministry of Philip. 
right? He's one of those wise deacons chosen because, you know, uh, he has the wisdom of the Spirit. Uh, and then uh, notice how he goes into all the marginal places, right? So he works with the Greek-speaking Jewish widows. They have that issue with the Hebrew-speaking Jewish widows or Aramaic-speaking Jewish widows. Uh, and he comes in, right, and, and tries to solve the situation. And then he goes out to the Samaritans, as we know, and to the Ethiopian eunuch. All people who fell in some way or shape were actually excluded. And questions were raised, you know, are they in or are they out? Well, that's what life in the Spirit looks like for the earliest church as it is embodied in a ministry that I would really see as a ministry of hospitality uh, by uh, 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 Philip. Uh, anyway, so what is the Spirit up to in the text? Well, first is an invitation to come and see with the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Come and see the great things that God is doing, surprising us out of Galilee and through Galileans today. Come and see with the eyes of the Spirit. So there's an invitation there. Then also we are calling upon the Holy Spirit. And this is, and you could do this with an, a prayer for the Holy Spirit to come and open our eyes, for instance. I didn't do that for this sermon. I could have. I chose to begin by speaking in Spanish to make everyone nervous. <laughs> right? To, to help them kind of hear the strangeness. You know, I chose to speak as a Galilean to begin the sermon. And what, I didn't do it here, but when I actually did it at the seminary, I said, don't worry, I am not going to preach in Spanish. And everyone was like, oh, okay. But you see, it's, that, it's, it's culturally dislocating people just enough to make them uncomfortable. <laughs> and therefore, they're ready to listen, right? So how do you do that when you preach, right? So that people are kind of tuned in, right? So I started by speaking as a Galilean with my accent, and then that's kind of how I went. So, um, so what I'm trying to do is to help people then interpret reality theologically, right? So in other words, interpret reality not in terms of there is nothing uh, good that can come out of Nazareth, which would be interpreting reality you know, according to the flesh, but rather interpret theologically according to God's own way of seeing things. And that is the common see, right? Interpret it with the eyes of the Holy Spirit, right? Who works uh, in Jesus out of Galilee and then through Jesus' disciples, uh, disciples, excuse me, uh, uh, also from Galilee to the world. And this is where I play around with the image of eyes of the flesh, eyes of the Holy Spirit, Eyes of the flesh, eyes of the Holy Spirit. I actually got that from um, Luther's lectures on Genesis. Uh, he has a section where he talks about, this is later in his life. He has a section where he talks about Abraham's hospitality. Remember when the three strangers at Manra showed up? So Abraham's hospitality to the three strangers. And... Um, um, and, and Luther uh, takes that and says, you know, the church is the house of Abraham in the world. The church ought to embody in the world the hospitality of Abraham towards strangers. And then Luther says, sometimes we look at strangers through the eyes of the flesh. And then they become a problem. Right? Uh, they are an obstacle. They're in the way. But if we look at strangers through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, right, then we see that God has come to us and is visiting us and doing things through the strangers among us. So that's where I got that eyes of the flesh, eyes of the Spirit, right? So it's a way of inviting people to interpret reality pneumatically or pneumatologically or, or in a Holy Spirit type of way. Uh, so that was part of what I had in mind also as I was inviting people to enter into uh, the preaching event. And in the hopes that then they would embody, right? Call upon the Spirit in their own lives to embody hospitality. 
right? I mean, we're still dealing with a church that's less than 1% Hispanic, right? So we need a lot of calling upon the Holy Spirit. <laughs> because one thing is to know in the head the statistics. Another thing is to embody, right? Um, uh, embody the kind of life, right, that would bring in and uh, participate with and share life together uh, with the Galilean uh, disciples of our day. So you saw this in the sermon particularly where I helped, uh, uh, both, uh, well, where, where I helped first, I think, the predominantly English-speaking, culturally German audience um, recognized that they too were once marginalized, right, in the hopes then of saying, uh, or moving them to say, uh, okay, then maybe we also should have a heart for those who were once like our forefathers and foremothers. This is very much how the Old Testament operates when it comes to aliens, for instance, right? right. Uh, you, uh, you know how you were aliens in Egypt, and you saw what Yahweh did for you, right? So I was uh, operating out of that biblical narrative when I made that move, Okay. Um, but time goes by and one forgets and gets comfortable and then one becomes a center and forgets about the margins and all of that, right? So you have to bring people back to the margins <laughs> to, so that they might re-encounter themselves and who they are. Uh, and so I did that also uh, at the end of the sermon where I said the church itself is a bunch of Galileans. So there is a, a sort of indirect invitation here to live out and embody life in the Spirit as a life of hospitality, bringing in those who are excluded either by society or the church from the kingdom for whatever reason that is. Um, so uh, this would be then an example of uh, preaching in a way that the theme of marginality and welcoming is brought to the forefront, uh, which is very much part of how Hispanic Latinos, for instance, uh, um, engage uh, uh, the whole issue of the Galilean location and identity of the church. But also it was a way to do it... Um, um, in such a way that people will be invited to a certain form of life. And I will call that a form of life in the Spirit. It's not the only way to talk about life in the Spirit. You know, in this book I have at least five different ones, right? But this is one of them within the theme of hospitality and welcome. So those would be, I think, my reflections on everything that went into that little homily. <laughs> I mean, in some ways it helps me appreciate the challenge that is uh, to preach, you know, in a way that is uh, uh, challenging and relevant, but also that brings people into a particular story that can shape their way of thinking and hopefully also their way of living. So I think with that, I'm going to stop, if that's okay, and uh, we can either have uh, David come up or have questions now, up to you. <laughs> I'd actually like to start with a question to you. Um, thank you. First of all, if you were, I'm imagining that you're only with the certificate students. Um, and the, the flash that opened up for me was when you talked about Nathaniel being a Galilean. Mm -hmm. So when he asked the question, can anything good come out of Galilee, he's asking it about himself. Yeah. So I go, oh, wow. I wonder what you would have done pastorally now, not just as a preacher, but pastorally. What could, mm -hmm. could you imagine doing with the Nathaniels that were in front of you? Oh, man, yeah. Yeah, so... 
Okay, so full disclosure. Okay, full disclosure. Um, I did a similar sermon for an audience that was primarily Hispanic Latino at, a, at our Hispanic National Convention. Right, so I share with you kind of a double audience sermon, uh, which presented its own challenges. Uh, but there was one where I was dealing with all the Nathaniels, uh, and only them, mostly. Uh, and um, so what I had to do there was to kind of affirm their dignity and value before God. So it was kind of a pastoral move to, to help them see what God is doing in their own lives and ministry, which often struggle and are marginalized. And so it was a different preaching strategy, right? So I did have to kind of take a, a, a pastoral a tone. Uh, uh, I had to, um, you're dealing also with a shame-honor culture, as opposed to like a guilt culture. Um, so I had to help them deal with kind of the shame of not belonging or feeling that they were excluded or did not belong to the church. And which meant that I had to honor the gifts that God has given them, but they might not fully recognize, right? Or fully celebrate. So I made a big deal out of celebrating what God is doing out of Galilee through modern day Galileans like yourselves. And you're in good company because Jesus and his disciples are from Galilee. So, hey... You know, God is doing good things through you. Yeah. Um, so I had to sort of use the sermon to move them from a Nathaniel mindset and a kind of a shame uh, mindset to right a Philip mindset um, to an, a place of honor. Yeah. You know, and and this is a culture where I come from as a Latin American. I mean, I will go to my deathbed, okay, wondering whether I honor my family. That's just the way it is, you know. That's what you're dealing with. And Virgilio Elizondo, I understand guilt, okay, especially at a theological level. I teach about this stuff. But deep in the heart, I operate more with shame and honor, right? I don't deny guilt I, or the, the, the guilt uh, metaphors and narratives and the need for uh, reconciliation and things like that. But at a visceral level, it's about honor and shame for me. For other cultures, it's about fear and power, you know, things like that. Uh, so, yeah, no, that, that's, I thank you for that question, actually. Yeah. That was, so, yeah. And so the message that you're preaching to the Nathaniels, you actually yeah. are embodying. Right. Because you're Dr. Sanchez. Right. Right? <laughs> right. What God can do. Yeah, in a way, I, and again, you know, if you come from uh Kind of a, well, both Lutheran, but I will also say Anglo. Uh, but let's focus on Lutheran a little bit. If you come from the Lutheran tradition, you know, uh, there's always a big emphasis, and I think this is true of the Calvinist tradition, the emphasis on human depravity and sin and that kind of stuff, right? So you don't want to say good things about yourself because you sound like a proud sinner. Like, like if you say, look at Dr. Leo Sanchez and what God has done through him, Right, an Anglo Lutheran might say, "Well, isn't he a little proud of himself?" Over there? <laughs> <laughs> Thereby, totally missing the point. Right. So, if you're operating out of a guilt culture, you might start thinking in terms of sin and and that kind of stuff. Um, You've got a lot of translation to do, don't you? <laughs> yeah, there's cultural translation going on. You know, theological, theological, and all of that, right? So, so then the uh, so the idea is to, and, and you know how I learned uh, that it was okay actually to take pride uh, in what in the things that God is doing through you it was actually from my Hispanic uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Hispanic theologian by the name of Orlando Espin who just retired. He used to teach at, uh, I think, the University of San Diego, the Catholic University. And, um, and I remember he said to me, I was uh, a Princeton Theological uh, helping a, um, a teacher 
a professor uh, assisting him in a class, you know. And then uh, Orlando Spin came to me and said, the students said you did such a good, good job, you know, as a teaching assistant. And I was sort of, you know, being my Lutheran, whatever, pitying pity myself over here. And, and then he, he, he came over to me and he looked at me straight in the eyes, you know, like this. And he said to me, no, you have to rejoice and celebrate the gifts you've been given. Just like that. And he, he, so he was taking me out of my Nathaniel. That's like a prophetic word, <laughs> well, really. Like, yeah, it really was. The Holy Spirit provided prophetic oh, word. Oh, man, that just shift, yeah. shift my thinking, you know. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, the reason I asked that question is I was sitting there, and I've been invited into um, helping four men behind prison walls in Ionia. Um, there's a church that was planted behind the walls about 10 years ago. And it's developed to the point now where uh, even the correction system of the state of Michigan is saying there's something very valuable here. And they want the, the church wants these four men to follow an ordination track that will be finished in about two years. And then they get sent out two by two to other prisons to plant churches. And one of them is named Crisanto, so he's Latino. But all four of these men are Nathaniels. Because they think, and they have shame and guilt for the reason they're in prison for all these years. So, I'm, can I borrow your sermon and just tweak it for them and contextualize it? Amen. Man, thank you. Uh, when I first was uh, coming to seminary here, uh, a friend that I met here, Dante Venegas, a Puerto Rican from New York City, Dante Alighieri Venegas. His father loved Italian, so. And uh, I got to know Dante here, and then I actually became co-pastors with him at Madison Church. But while I was in seminary, after the first year was finished, I got my license to preach. And my very first sermon as a, as a licensed preacher was going to be at uh, Madison Church, where he was co-pastoring. And... Um, on Saturday, so the day before, he said, let's go pray together at the, at the church. So he knew that I would be um, especially nervous about preaching in the congregation that people knew me. And so we rode our bikes down to the church, and um, I thought we'd be there for five or six minutes. You know, like I used to say, pray for the missionaries on the foreign and domestic fields and the sins of omission and commission. And then we're kind of done. No, we prayed for an hour, and um, he started with confession, and he was kneeling. And um, actually, partway for, through his um, confession, I thought, oh, no, he's being so specific, and my turn is next. <laughs> so we confessed our sins, and he had anointing oil, and he anointed me with oil and prayed over me. And then he anointed the pulpit with oil. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, may this be a place of power tomorrow morning. And then the piano where his wife played the piano. And then he started walking on between the pews, and he knew where people were be seated the next day, and he would pray by name over people. And then he, he had told me, bring your notes. So I, he said, put them out on the steps here. And uh, we prayed over the sermon notes and... Um, Here's what happened. Oh, there were also the, all the doorways got prayed over and anointed with oil. And it made me, it's interesting what happened. It made me humbled um, because I felt like it took away my self-assurance about my theological understanding and communication gifts at the same time, it made me way more confident that God was going to do his work and something was going to happen. And it, the next morning when I walked in there, I could actually see, um, if I turned my head the right way, shining off these crosses all over the building, on the pews and the piano and the pulpit. So the place felt, to me when I walked into it, it felt consecrated and alive with the Spirit's presence. That was in 1979. And um, 
ever since then, every Sunday morning, I've gotten up early, and in our sanctuary now, we actually have wooden crosses that haven't been finished, so they absorb oil. And I I go through and I anoint all the um, crosses, and I confess my sins, and I pray, and I walk through the... uh, through the chairs, and I, pr- I know where people are seated, so I pray for them. Um, so I've found ways to open myself to the Holy Spirit's presence and power in that place. And it was because of that one time of um, my mentor teaching me how to practically be, embody this openness. I would quickly want to tie it to a couple of things, because reading the chapter on hospitality that you just preached a sermon on from your book... Um, made me think of a, a few things where the Holy Spirit used those preparation times for me and making it feel like I was walking into a consecrated space. Um, just listen to the Spirit speaking to me in that, in that moment. Okay, so one of them is a 15-year-old girl in our congregation. She's now 25 probably, so this is about 10 years ago. She had a really beautiful voice. And she could also play the piano. So um, she started playing at the evening services. So she's young and female. And in a a fairly large setting, there's hundreds of people in the sanctuary. And um, nervous about being able to uh, play and sing at the same time and lead our congregation in worship. And one of the first times she got invited to play and sing on a Sunday morning where the church is full... Um, and we had two services. In between services, I said, Kristen, I'd like to talk to you, and I'd like your parents to be there too. And it's good. It's nothing. It sounds like the principal's calling you to the office, right? So I've learned to say, this is a good thing. You'll feel blessed. You're not in trouble. <laughs> and I said to Kristen um, with her parents there, I said, the reason I have your parents here is because I want them to hear this and be able to affirm what I think God is doing in your life. I said, you might have the most beautiful voice in this church, and I know some people have already told you that. You could have one of the most beautiful voices in West Michigan. But beautiful voices in the scheme of the whole world are kind of a dime a dozen. But your beautiful voice and then your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, what I would call soulful singing, you have that. And Kristen, the gift God gives you doesn't actually belong to you. It belongs to the people of God. Just like the gift of... Do you think I have a preaching gift? I knew she would say yes to that. I said, it doesn't actually belong to me. It belongs to the people of God. And that means I have to develop it. I've got to care for it. But I especially have to put it under the power of the Spirit because if your giftedness is what you lean into and leads you and your character doesn't develop and your dependence on God enough, it will just be a dime a dozen. So I want you to protect that and pray for it. I want your parents to pray for it too. So that was, I didn't plan that actually. It happened in the moment, um, which it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit doesn't work with planning because if the Holy Spirit didn't work with planning, the Holy Spirit would never be able to work with a Christian Reformed Church. I'm pulling, I'm pulling our leg a little bit here. <laughs> if some of you are Christian Reformed. Um, but I was sensitive to that. Now, let me give you one other example. So the, I wouldn't exactly call Kristen marginalized, but she was in a vulnerable place because she's just starting to give her gift, and she's young. So let me tell you about a, another uh, story where I think the um, anointing the sanctuary and being aware of the Spirit's presence and expecting the Spirit to surprise, to use one of the things you've been talking about this morning, is we, had two, we have two services. I drink coffee in the morning. Um, we got water in the front, and I preached the first sermon, and then, and then we have about a half an hour break between services, and I was interacting with people the whole time. Then the second service starts, and it's offering time, and it's just before the preaching, and um, I have to use the bathroom. So... so Out I go, and I walk down the aisle out to the back where the bathrooms are. And one of the things I pray for on Sunday mornings while I'm going through the pews is I, and I don't literally mean 100, but I'll say, Holy Spirit, give me 100 touches this morning of your people. And touches can even be a nod, 
Sometimes they're literal touches. They're, sometimes they're holding someone's hand. They're praying for someone. And um, it's not as if I have a clicker in my pocket and count them, but I know that God can use over and over again um, interactions with God's people as a pastor. And um, I was walking down, and I nodded to a couple people, and then way in the back was a guy I hadn't seen in a long time. And I, and I just I got his eye contact. I touched his shoulder and, and walked to use the bathroom and then walked by him again. By the time I walked back in the sanctuary... I had forgotten I had touched this guy on the shoulder. Um, the next day, I get an email from him, and he said, I haven't been in church for months. And um, he talked about struggling with addiction and feeling shameful about that. He woke up that morning, and here's literally his prayer. God, would you touch me some way today? He, met it more, he meant it metaphorically. And um, God enabled him to go to church. And he said, when you went by and touched my shoulder, and I had forgotten, he said it was like electric shock went through me. And that God had said, see, I see you. You're forgiven. You actually belong here. And um, so, so when I was reading your book and thinking about the way I try to prepare my heart for the Holy Spirit and the marginalization thing, um, those are some of the connections I made. Now, the two of us have been talking a long time. <laughs> I'd like to hear from you all. And Scott, are you going to facilitate this? I see you getting up. Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, if you have questions for, uh, for Leo or, or David or both uh, on, on anything they touched on or on the other things that have sparked in you, I'll ferry the mic to you so that it can get on the recording. Thank you, David. Um, more of a comment, but David, when you started with the, the questions for Leo about that Nathaniel perspective, when Nathaniel does get up and come and see, doesn't Jesus call him a true Israelite? Mm. Right. So he doesn't call him a true Galilean or a true yeah. Judean from Jerusalem. He says, yeah. now there's a true Israelite. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that identity in Christ mm. Mm this all-encompassing, th yeah, th these are the people that I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and I, I wonder if um, the reference there to Israelite or Israel, uh, meaning, you know, particularly, I mean, this is what God's people, you know, these are the people of God, right? So if you look at Israel's own history, right, there's a history there of coming out of Egypt and, you know, so you could play around with that a little bit, you know, that, that maybe even though the term Israelite is used, it might be affirming something of a Galilean identity. Mm, yeah. You know? I follow. Uh, but that's something to, I've never actually thought of that. That's, that's an interesting point. Yeah, there might be a connection there. Um, my question is about that your audience, the contextualization. So, about that group of Hispanic group. Yeah. How do you think that they heard your sermon? Again, because I couldn't help but thinking that your message is very hospitable, inclusive, but it is more, whether intentionally or unintentionally, right. challenging. <laughs> the English speaking people to be yeah. more hospitable. Okay, I got speak. caught. I got caught. Yeah. So All right. how how did you expect <laughs> or what was was their surprise? How did that yeah. the Hispanic group right. heard your message? Yeah, and I experienced this also at the other venue, well, the Hispanic National Convention. Um uh, I think some uh heard it as an affirmation of their ministries. Um, which are, in many cases, not affirmed enough. Uh, we have a number of Hispanic workers working in worker priests situations where they have to both fend for themselves in a different kind of work and do the full work of ministry. Uh, we have uh, Hispanic workers uh, working situations where... Um, 
maybe the um, governing body of the district where they work uh, might say, uh, you have three years to make this uh, grow, and I'll give you a, a little startup money, and then we'll take the money away. You know, so in other words, uh, struggling under models of ministry that may not fit the situation at the margins. Um, and of course, they struggle sometimes with people who believe that they don't have the right credentials. Well, so you went through a certificate program. You know, why didn't you go through a full-time residential program, right? So that means you're less of a minister than someone else who's more fully a minister. Uh, and these things are openly heard by them, or sometimes they're kind of in the background, or, or you know, they know that people think this way, but they don't say anything. Um, and so I think because of that, there were many who felt affirmed, right? Um, more so, I think, in the Hispanic Convention version of this, because it was more addressed to the Hispanic Latino. Uh, now, I have to confess, though, that there was also a danger here. And, and I heard some of the Hispanic people come by and, say, and, and actually identify Jerusalem with, like, the Anglos and the English-speaking people, you know. And so you have to be careful with a sermon like this because it could be interpreted by the Hispanic as an affirmation of how bad the Anglos are. <laughs> and how sinful the Anglos are, and how prejudiced the Anglos are, and how, you see? And at that point, uh, then it becomes less about God and more about, right, the different versions, versions of sinfulness that we have in our church. So, some, because you preach a sermon with a certain intention, right, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be heard the way you intend it. And so, uh, so we have to be aware of that. So at that point, I think the, the hearer took it maybe in a different direction that maybe gave him, uh, maybe it affirmed uh, his or her feeling about being marginalized and, 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 and so on by an Anglo brother or something like that. But, you know, th con this conviction wasn't where I wanted to end, you know, but I'll say this. Having said that, I'm going to say this too. Part of preaching under the Spirit is that you're not in control. Meaning that the Spirit can take a certain word that He wants someone to hear. And it might be actually something different from what you wanted them to hear. And I think that's okay. It led to a conversation where we actually had to talk a little bit about those dynamics of power and prejudice within the church. You know what I mean? So um, I remember one time a colleague of mine at the seminary preached a sermon. He had a certain intention, you know, something he wanted to get across. And um, someone said, well, here's what I heard. And my colleague said, well, you didn't get it. <laughs> Is it really? Maybe the Holy Spirit wanted to when he to hear something slightly different, right? So I, I think that's something you have to recognize. Uh, you can do your best preparation, understand your audience the best you can, decide which homiletical approach you're going to use. And you saw all the stuff I went through. I mean, theologically, contextually, right? But at the end of the day, it's not your sermon, you know? And so God can give some more convictions, some more uh, uh, appreciation for the gifts of God, and so, so, and sometimes it might lead to conversations and so on. So, some of us are preachers, and I'm a preacher, and um, there are times it doesn't happen often, but when someone comes up to me with tears in their eyes and quotes me mm. and what God said to them in that sentence, wow. I never wow. said that sentence, not even close to it. Mm, some of you have had that experience where. So I don't argue with them. I've learned not to argue with them. So, oh, thank God. Tell me some more about what God said to you. <laughs> yeah, you can't anoint the whole church and then hope to be in control, right? 
<laughs> doesn't happen that way. Yeah, God doesn't <laughs> seem to be big on our control. <laughs> right. Um, when, when I'm thinking about preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and today I think you've encouraged us to um, expect God to surprise us or expect the unexpected, be, be open to that. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if either or both of you could share, uh, and David, you've done that a little bit already, but practically, what, what might that look like for preachers? You know, um, we can say in our minds, yeah, God could show up today, mm. but are there ways in which we, either in our preparation or in our delivery, um, how do we make space in the way that uh, the message is brought or heard for the Spirit to show up, you know, and to... Um, what are some practical things? I know I've heard some people say, well, I tend not to use a manuscript. I mean, I might write a manuscript, but I, I kind of leave it in my office because I want to mm-hmm. be more attentive in, in the moment. Yeah. Are there other things that you could suggest for me from your own experience, things that you leave room for the power of the Holy Spirit to be present? Yeah. Well, one of the things I have in, in increasingly begun to do more, and I think this is part of, uh, especially after writing the book, or or as I was writing the book, was to actually do the, uh, the you know, the fancy term is the epiclesis, right? So the, a prayer for the descent of the Spirit. Um, and I come from a tradition where prayers to the Holy Spirit are not common. I mean, usually you pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus, or something like that, you know. So uh, so I've become mo- more and more appreciative of asking the Holy Spirit to come right, and do something today, you know, without telling the Holy Spirit what to do. <laughs> right? But, um, I mean, when we talk about sanctification, I mean, uh, even Lutherans were very strong on justification, uh, we'll also talk about cooperation with the Spirit in sanctification, you know. And so this idea that being under the Spirit, we call out for the Spirit to, you know, do His work in our lives on account of our need, you know. We can always use more of, right, the Holy Spirit. So learning uh, to come up with come Holy Spirit uh, prayers, so going through this book, I had a pastor friend of mine who kind of read through it and said, we need prayers for each of these chapters. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, right, right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so what we're working on now is for the, you know, for the book to be an invitation to prayer, for the Holy Spirit to come. And then shape this kind of life in me, in us. You know, and uh, so that's something that I have learned to do more and more. Didn't do it today, you know, decided to go a different route. Uh, the other thing I would say is, um, and again, the sermon today didn't do that uh, as, as much. I have done it in other uh, sermons where I actually pick a Holy Spirit narrative. Try to bring the Holy Spirit into some kind of, you know, so in order to biblically ground what I'm talking about. And show that this is a way in which the Spirit operates. So making the Spirit more explicit. Sometimes it's more implicit, but sometimes I try to make it more explicit. Just to kind of rub it in people's faces a little bit, you know. <laughs> so anyway, those are some... I was wondering if you get any pushback on when you started anointing the church and things like that. Because I know if I did that in a Lutheran church, they might someone might be asking questions like... Why are you doing that? Yeah. You know, I, I, well, <laughs> well uh, there's a there was a mix of Pentecostals in our church, and Dante Venegas, uh-huh. uh, Christian Reformed minister, ordained Christian Reformed minister, grew up Lutheran. Interestingly, mm-hmm. when he got saved, <laughs> interesting way to put that. <laughs> grew up Lutheran, was nominally Christian. Yeah, right. Got saved, went to the Pentecostal church, and was Puerto Rican. Yeah. So his culture and expression were different than the Dutch white church. Mm. But there was that mix, plus African Americans. So there wasn't as much barrier to get through for me. But I also tried to be as smart as I could about, for example, um, some of you know the Heidelberg Catechism. Do you? You ask the question? You're a Heidelberg Catechism guy? Yeah. Sort of look like one. 
Okay. <laughs> um, so one of our questions is, and why is he called Christ? Because he is anointed by the Spirit to be our prophet, priest, and king. The next question is, and why are you called a Christian, which means anointed one? Because you likewise are to be God's prophet, priest, and ruler over the powers of darkness. Mm -hmm. That's very common for me to talk about in our congregation. So I tie it to our own tradition and then try to unpack it. And I didn't tell people I was doing this for at least a couple decades. I was in the same church for 38 years. But so about 20 years in... um, some people would ask me about my morning, and I would say, you know, I get here really early. And if they asked me when, I would say 4.30. And I'm not saying do it my way. I'm just saying find a way to feel, you know, consecrate your sanctuary. Do it on Saturday night or whatever. Um, by the way, the sanctuary is already consecrated. But I don't, I'm not very aware of it unless I actually do something physical. Mm-hmm. Um, but the worship teams who were rehearsing and the ushers who got there earlier wanted to watch me do it and do it with me. So, so now I actually do it later in the morning, and they're rehearsing, but they're watching me and a, usually a prayer servant go around, and they start to feel like this sanctuary is a holy place and that they're anointed to do God's work. So I'll often anoint them with oil. And then I tie it to our tradition so that they don't have to overcome this thing about, is it Roman Catholic? Mm. I'll say, no, it's Lutheran, actually. No. <laughs> I'll say it's Christian Reform. It's right in our Heidelberg Catechism. There it is. So, um, Let me also just say, in response to, I think you can preach this way with a manuscript. I think you, in your preparation, you keep asking the Holy Spirit, where might there be points where me as a pastor actually writing in the manuscript, the Holy Spirit may well be saying this to you right now, especially if you're having this kind of experience. Just put it in your manuscript. And by the way, the Holy Spirit can work with stuff that's written years ago. Mm. All right, it's called the Bible, so... <laughs> Well, the, the other thing I would say that I sort of um, uh, try to do was to, um, and again, you know, how does my own life embody a certain form of life in the Spirit? So the Galilean identity and uh, so what we talked about earlier today. Um, and, and that actually plays in well also with studies on spirituality and religion in North America. Uh, think of Robert Wuthnow, for instance, the sociologist of religion, the rock star, right, of the sociology of religion, uh, who says that uh, when it comes to uh, millennials, uh, uh, post-millennials, they're not looking for models of, you know, people who tell you what the tradition says and this kind of, this is not the primary way that people today are, are looking for spiritual wisdom, right? Um, uh, where you're grounded in that tradition and all of that. And then he says, but, but religious leaders also are not just sort of shopkeepers giving you whatever you want. Uh, and then would now say, when you look at the service, they're always looking for uh, people who act according to the way they preach. So it's, it's the embodiment of the spiritual life that sort of brings people into consideration of life in the Spirit. So that's different than what he calls dwelling-oriented churches, where, you know, the religious leader is basically the one who speaks what the church has said. Or more of the tinkerer-type uh, marketplace idea where I, you know, Give you whatever you want for the right price or whatever. People are looking for embodiment, for modeling. So that's another way I think of, you know, how does one, without saying Holy Spirit, ask the Spirit that one might somehow embody the form of life that might help you. And of course, we're not going to embody that perfectly, right? Uh, But a little bit of that Galilean identity. When I was preaching, I was trying to do that. Read chapter 8 of his book. Yeah, right. On the, on the. One more thing I would say is that 
I don't greet people at the back door. No, I know I lose something for that, but I stand with a prayer servants afterwards, and almost every week someone comes up and is moved by something that's happened in the service, maybe the sermon, and there's a Holy Spirit connection and moment right there to speak prophetically into their life or just intercede for them. So I don't do the thing where I stand at the door. It's very seldom. And if I do, it's like, wow, you're actually greeting at the door because I never do it. I'm always in the front mm-hmm. with prayer time. And then there's prayer servants. And I, when we introduced it in our church, I said to the elders um, and other spiritual leaders like, like worship leaders, if you never come forward for prayer, we don't really mean it. So you've got to be up there several times a year and receiving prayer. And I need to do it myself or I don't really mean it. It's not right. So anyway. I'm wondering, Dr. Sanchez, if you could um, expand a little bit on... The Bevan's idea of moving from the particular to the universal, yeah. the transcendental approach, and um, in particular, uh, the reason I'm asking or requesting for you to expand on it is because you can imagine a situation in which your particular story is uh, actually alienating uh, to yeah. the audience in ways right. that you might not expect. I think in your example, you had a really nice tie-in with... Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, how German Lutherans were also once at the margins and became the center. So that, that works really well. Right, right. Um, but, right. but you can see it um, going sideways yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I wonder if you can just kind of discuss a little bit more about what that looks like, how, how to think through the steps of uh, sharing your unique particular story and right. not losing people along the way. Yeah, I... Um, I remember having a conversation, I think it was with Francis, Francis Watson, right, who, who does some work on uh, biblical hermeneutics. And I remi- uh, remember asking him about a text, and I said something like, can you do this with the text? And, and he said, uh, well, I mean, if it's convincing enough, you know, <laughs> so, so okay, that's, that's a great explanation, you know, for a hermeneutics guy, you know, if it's convincing enough. So I think what he was trying to say was, you have to at some point... Uh, ground the particular experience in s- some kind of biblical narrative. So you're kind of operating, um, you're operating in a way that the experience is not sort of foreign to the biblical story. And I, th- and I think that's part of the trick. Uh, I think that's what he was getting at. Is that, well, you could have a particular story that really has nothing to do with it or runs counter to it. But can you kind of play with it and within it? And can you ride a wave of the story? This kind of stuff, you know? Um, and, and I think also, uh, I think Elizondo is able to do some of that. Um, um, Vevens actually doesn't use Elizondo as an example of this model, but he uses Justo Gonzalez, who is the historian of church history, right? Um, and, uh, and Justo Gonzalez, you know, speaks of the Hispanic experience as an experience of mestizaje, the coming together of cultures and races. And, and mestizaje um, was seen as kind of a shameful thing. So you have the shame culture idea. Uh, and yet out of the mestizos, God has brought about a church, and this mestizo church reflects the, the Church of All Nations, you know. Um, and so the experience of mestizaje could, could be a very particular experience of, you know, the Spanish colonization and the conquest and colonization of the Americas and a source of shame um, uh, becomes, in light of the biblical witness uh, uh, to the story of... Uh, Jesus himself who comes out of Galilee and the, the story of the, you know, the vision of Revelation that the churches of all nations, right? So right in the wave, as it were, right? Um, so this experience then becomes, uh, in light of biblical narrative, a way for us to consider 
the, you know, how God can work out of the margins, basically, right? The Galilean principle. So in that place it worked, but as you could tell from my discussion earlier, someone kind of took it in a different direction just to talk about discrimination and prejudice and racism. Um, I said, well, how do we then use that in a way that we acknowledge it, right, but also bring people back into the narrative? So I think that's the challenge, you know. Uh, finding a way that the experience uh, connects to the biblical narrative, I would say, is part of that. Um, I have something else I was going to say on that. Ah, also, you have to acknowledge that this is only one experience and one set of biblical narratives. It's not the whole story, right? Um, so, for instance, when you read Virgilio Elizondo, A God of Incredible Surprises, it really operates a lot of the shame honor narrative. So obviously he's gonna be not gonna be talking about guilt and sin and reconciliation as much. And that might make some people uncomfortable, right? Because he's going to emphasize more how God is for those who are victims of sin. You know. Uh, so he's not really considering, for instance, that we are all guilty of sin or something like that, right? So those are different sets of narratives, right? So that's another thing to recognize with the, this transcendental model that an experience is not the story. You know, it's a way to uh, bring to light or illustrate the story and call people to embody it. But that's just kind of part of the story, not the whole thing. So if you acknowledge that, then you can say, you know, don't be so hard on me. You know, I was just talking about part of the Bible, not the whole thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Leo, you strike me as being um, gifted by God to be emotionally sensitive to stuff, just hearing you talk. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I'm the part of the majority culture, so I'm going to not be sensitive to certain things that I just need to learn. Mm -hmm. And in answer to your question, I think one of the things that I have done, if you're pastoring in a place long enough and you build enough equity of trust, people will come to you and tell you how you've offended them. Mm -hmm. And very often I will say to them, um, I would like to write this conversation up just short and send it to you. And then um, let me ask your permission whether or not I can share that, usually without your name, so that I can unpack it a little bit. It's usually not in a sermon. It's just sort of a pastoral moment, especially if I could say some, most of you were here last week. I made this comment. One of you gracefully came to me and talked to me. Let's talk about, I want to talk about, and then I get that person's permission, and I actually push them um, to... Um, interact with me in such a way that I hear the Spirit better through them because I know I'm their pastor and they, they might just say yes to that without interacting with me to help me become more sensitive. You do that once or twice, more and more people come to you and make you better. And I can't not be white. I can't not be part of the majority culture. So I'm going to have to count on people helping me and then learn into that situation. I'm a learner here and here's something we learned last week. Mm -hmm. for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. I have a question about um, um, receptivity. Um, of um, I'm, I'm just formulating this as I think. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, in the move from southern Ontario to come to seminary here mm -hmm. about 20 years ago, um, uh, we had I had to deal with the issue or of of uh, privilege uh, both my parents are are um, I, I I grew I'm a Dutch guy I'm tall I stick out like a sore thumb um, but both my parents are are uh, immigrants out of World War two and they had to work and work hard and long when we came here as students, um, my wife, my kids, and we just couldn't, you know, we just, this, this is Jerusalem. Yeah? <laughs> and for us. So, so how, has, how has the uh, conversation of marginalization 
been received in the land of privilege. Um, uh, could you repeat that last part? Has received. How has you got the mics on? How has the how has the uh, conversation um, of marginalization been received in the land of privilege? Be that St. Louis oh, or. Grand Rapids or whatever you want to call it yeah. uh, because I, I really valued what you had to say today yeah. uh, but sometimes some of us get shocked when we move into a different place yeah. sure. and all of a sudden what was marginalization is now privilege right thank you um, yeah I, I would say that um, you have to kind of appreciate what you're saying. You, you have to kind of be authentic about this stuff, right? So there are different levels of marginality, different levels of exclusion, different levels of privilege, and so on. Uh, so, for instance, I was actually raised middle class. My family comes out of a working class background. The kids went to college and, and, and so on. My father had actually pretty good jobs growing up in Panama. So the level of, you know, I can't say that my level of marginality is a socioeconomic one uh, compared to other uh, Hispanic, Latinos, or Latin Americans with whom I was raised, right? And so you have to acknowledge that, right? But my father always, always t uh, taught us something growing up, and he said, he, and he said you know, uh, we came out of a tough background, and it was really difficult for us, and therefore you should always remember that. So even though you're more privileged now, remember where you came from, right? And so when I when I was, uh, uh, you know, I think it was in fifth grade or something, he sent me to a, uh, a kind of a military camp, which was mostly for underprivileged kids, and he sent it to me just so that I could live life with them, which would have been like his childhood, you know. And I remember hating him for that. <laughs> uh, but then I remember, you know, uh, going to school, and then I would see some of the the guys that we went through three months together of this military camp. They were, you know, trying to make ends meet, selling things on the streets, you know, and and they would say, "Hey, uh, Sanchez, how you doing, Sanchez?" You know, and and but we were, you know, human beings working together, doing things together. But that doesn't mean that I didn't acknowledge my privilege, right? So then the question is, what are you going to do with it? Right? And so what my dad was teaching us was solidarity. Right? So solidarity doesn't mean that now I'm going to be exactly like people in their marginality, but rather that you're going to be a voice for people who are marginalized, enter their world and see how, right, you can... Uh, you know, uh, raise their voices, right? How you can highlight their contributions and that kind of stuff. And that's, I think, it's a solidarity comes in different ways. You don't have to make it look like you're more marginalized than you are. In some cases, you might be, in others, you might not, right? And so, um, what is that area of privilege where you could be then of service to another as you enter their world? So that's one thing I would say. Another thing I would say is, I like to think of three levels of engagement with the other, right? One is what I would call the multicultural level, where you simply acknowledge that there is difference and that you have different cultures and languages and socioeconomic statuses and stuff like that, but you never really interact. And for some people, that's all they can handle. It's just the awareness of it, right? Uh, then you have cross-cultural exchanges where Usually there is a crossing into the other's culture and, you know, uh, poverty and so on. Um, and that's okay, but sometimes it tends to be one-sided. You know, the privileged one comes in and becomes the one who gives you stuff, and it's unilateral, and it creates paternalism and dependency. And so I, I, I'm not always comfortable with cross-cultural language, to be honest with you. Uh, I prefer to think more interculturally. It's kind of the new term now, right, where you're acknowledging the contributions of both sides. So it's more like a soccer team. You have def defense and you have offense and midfield and goalie, and everybody's contributing something even though they're different. So the intercultural, I think, is another way of, of thinking about this so as not to create dependency or, or paternalism. So what are the contributions that all people bring to the table 
And it's not just the privileged people who contribute. But it's, that's easier said than done. Because if we actually believe that, what would the church look like that believe that stuff? Who will be in leadership positions more often? Right? Whose articles will, be, uh, will we be reading in journals? What will be the last names in those articles? Right? I mean, what, what does an intercultural church look like? I think it's, it's a challenge, right? I was, I was going to ask you about that, too, just follow up real quickly. Um, my experience uh, of sort of the, the dominant white culture, including in the church, is that they have not seen themselves as Galileans. Um, they are the dominant culture. And there's these days, I think, uh, a, a palpable hankering to return. They feel threatened uh, that they that they may become the minority culture, that whites may right. become the minority culture. They're threatened by that. Um, so I was just sort of wondering, you know, uh, so you said, you know, there's a possible for your sermon to be heard as a critique of racism and prejudice. Right. But maybe some people need that critique um, yeah. and, and could have some resistance to the message, right. therefore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the spirit will give you what you need, right? Uh, and that's okay. That's part of the message. Conviction, right? But also, I think you have to help people reclaim a certain identity, right? Conviction for sin as an end in itself is not per se transformative. You have to move them into a new way of life. Right? In other words, beyond recognition of a problem to an actual embodiment of life in the spirit. And that's, that's another move. Yeah. Just quickly, um, recently because of uh, studies in the Word that I've been doing with the, our men's Bible study and so forth in Psalms, Psalm 8 starts, how majestic is your name, but quickly goes to out of the mouth of babes. It's kind of a surprising shift to weakness. And then in Revelation 5, John's weeping because there's no one to open the scroll. So the Lion of Judah, you know, the root of David comes, yeah. but... Who he sees is a lamb slain. So is this movement out of the marginality area always there? And do you see a connection with those kind of two passages? I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Because usually what happens is that people will say, well, so if God works out of the margins, he can never work out of the centers. You know, this kind of uh, a move. Um, it reminds me of liberation theologians in Latin America, and they used to talk about preferential option for the poor, right? And so people always kind of had a push against that. So what do you mean that God works only out of the places of marginality? What about the rest of the people? And one of the things Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, uh, the father of liberation theology, used to say to that was, you have to think of this not in the sense of excluding another, but you have to think of a priority of love, he says. All right. So my, the way I look at it is, you know, if I have a, my three-year-old, my five-year-old son wants to play with me, Daddy, Daddy, I want to play with you. But I got my two-year-old daughter with a poopy diaper. I love them both the same, right? But the priority of my love is going to go to the margins. Right? God loves all, all people, right? But God... We see in the Old Testament, for instance, especially thinking about, right? Who's he thinking about? The widows and the orphans and the poor and the aliens. Doesn't mean he doesn't love everybody. But sometimes if you love everybody, you don't love anybody. <laughs> it's never specific, you know. So there is something to the biblical narrative where God does things out of margins and has a special compassion in his heart for those who are uh, out there. And at the same time, you can say he loves everybody. And because he loves everybody, he's going to often pay attention, especially to those who are most unlovable. And that way, that really shows the depth of his universal love. It's not by being general. It's by being specific that he shows that he loves that deeply. So. Well, I'm going to pray for our lunch in a minute. But please, can we thank Leo and uh, David? Thank you, David.